So just imagine Charles uh, Francis Jenkins a hundred years ago on a platform like this talking about SMPE, S-M-P-E. And maybe he's talking to a group just like this and said, I'm going to look ahead a hundred years, Charles Francis Jenkins says. I'll look ahead a hundred years and tell you what the future is. And he predicts 10 years ahead, where he, in fact, runs a television station out of Washington, D.C., using mechanical television. And then he predicts another 20 years ahead or so, and he predicts NTSC. And then, then he says, let's add a T to SIMPTE in 1950. And then he goes all the way down and talks about SDI, and he predicts the cloud in 2006, and he talks about this meeting right here, right now. Could he have done that? Impossible. But maybe, just maybe, he could have looked ahead 20 years. And I'll show you why. If you read the paper that's associated with this, which I hope you do, there's a rationale in there as to how it's likely to look ahead 20 years and not be too far off. Of course, you'll be off in some areas. You might underestimate some and overestimate others. But I don't think it's a fool's errand to look ahead about 20 years and see what our world could look like. We can't look ahead 100. And I want to break this into two, uh, two, two sections here. One is accelerating technologies, a short review of technologies in general, and finally the evolution of infrastructure. Now you might have heard this quote before. Um, pred prediction is diff very difficult, especially if it's about the future. What famous baseball player said this, you know? Yogi Berra. I don't know if, if he actually thought it up himself or whether he was quoting a Danish proverb, because a lot of people have claimed to have said this. Now Niels Bohr was, in fact, a quantum physicist. He's the guy who said, if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't understand it. So, he, but he probably did say this around 1948. But he also said this. Technology has advanced more in the last 30 years. Now, if he said this in 1960, he was talking about 1930 to 1960 than in the previous 2000. And here is the key point. The exponential increase in advancement will only continue. So he saw this. In, in the 30 years he's talking about, with regard to 30, 1930 to 1960. So how much truer is that today than it was for Niels Bohr? So I've modified his first quote, and that may be of Yogi Berra, to say this. Prediction is not very difficult, especially if it's about the future of technology. Now, I can't predict in 10 seconds what's going to happen. There could be a, an earthquake, heaven forbid. We, we can't see ahead that far for things that are not related to technology. But with regard to some technological uh, aspects, we can look with confidence ahead. So let's consider some of that next. Now I'm calling this Wright's Law. I read a book by David McCullough. Maybe you've read it on the Wright brothers, Wilbur and, uh, uh, Wilbur and Orville. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. And I was reading through the book. I just came to a real appreciation of how those two individuals used scientific rigor. They built wind tunnels. Used scientific rigor they had unbelievable perseverance to be, able to, to be able to fly, and all the obstacles they had to overcome to be able to do it. And this is Orville here, so who would this be? Be Wilbur. And they, they, they asked a friend who was a neighbor here in Kitty Hawk to take the picture. This is the most, one of the most famous pictures of flight. Now, it was only about 12 seconds. And if you start and think, well, how did flight improve over time? Well, Charles Lindbergh, I keep pointing to this screen with my, my pointer, uh, 3,500 miles nonstop, because he went over the Atlantic Ocean, uh, 33 hours. So if you look at this and say, what's the growth in flight time? Uh, it's about 17 doublings over that particular period, or about one and a half miles per year increase on average. Now, you, you can go beyond that. Uh, Orville lived to see the jet engine he didn't live long enough to see us go to the moon. Now we'll be going to Mars. Factor all that in, and there's kind of an interesting law associated with that. Now, what, what law of electronics does this make you think of? Moore's law. Very good. So let's talk about Gordon Moore. 1965, my uh, teacher in high school was talking about uh, this magazine of electronics. Now, he didn't know anything about Moore's law, but I remember him talking about this amazing magazine called electronics. And Moore published this article that basically had five data points on it. And it was, uh, this is the log base two of the number of components or transistors for, for practical purpose today that would be on a particular IC. So he could see uh, a trend 
he drew a line, like all good scientists do, and he extended it because he was having fun with the extension. He drew it out to 1975, and there said, said there'd be 65,000 components, 2 to the 16th, on a, on, a, on a chip. Pretty impressive. Well, he's still alive today, and he, of course, couldn't see that in 2016 there'd be 2 to the 35 transistors on a chip, which is very close to an Intel product, an FPGA product, with 30 billion transistors. Now, the, the slope has changed a little bit. This, is, this was one to one, and uh, Brian uh, Krasnich, the CEO, said it's closer to about two and a half years per doubling now. Now, it won't continue forever. Um, the, the paper talks a lot about when it could end. Uh, one really interesting paper said it'll end by 2600. Well, that's pretty far from now, but that was a theoretical discussion. Others feel it may end a little bit closer to 2025, for example. But whatever the case may be, does anybody really think that the fundamental device of computing, that is the switch, the binary switch, the transistor, even if they, they, they can't find a way to uh, make it smaller, uh, that in fact they'll stop looking for ways to build switches. No, they won't. So maybe this law will, will bend a little bit and maybe it won't be called a transistor, but things will in fact continue. So here's just an example from the very first one, Jack Kilby's in 1950, he got the Nobel Prize for this. It was a phase shift oscillator, it put, it put out a sine wave, and that impressed everybody, and one transistor and a couple of resistors, and I think maybe an external capacitor. And in 58 years of growth, we have this. This is not the FPGA I mentioned earlier, this is a different one, 8-core uh, Xeon, which has got only 2.3 billion transistors, when the same company is actually already doing 30 billion transistors. So it is really hard to appreciate exponential growth. We're not built that way. It's not in our, our DNA to magically understand what exponential growth is. And many processes and ideas and concepts have had periods of exponential growth and then died off. Now, if you were making arrows, you better learn to make guns. If you uh, look at uh, number four here, AT&T did a pretty good job, American Telephone and Telegraph, of course, that, their name doesn't mean that anymore. It only means AT&T if you talk with them. But they made a good transition from the telegraph to the telephone. Other companies in our business made a good transition from analog to digital. But the one on the left eventually peters out, you might say. It plateaus. The one on the right is uh, the new person in town. And there's more here. There's uh, these obvious ones here, point-to-point. Uh, -point. I don't know what to call before the web. I was trying to think, what is it called before the web? Before the internet, we just had point-to-point -point connectivity. But I don't know what before the web is actually called other than pre-web. <laughs> That's about, about all I can think about there. But you know, if you're in this business on the left, you better find a way to get into the business on the right. And that's true for our business as well. So if you look at the bottom two here, custom AV is giving way to IP and commercial off-the-shelf systems. Commercial off-the-shelf. And facility only is giving away to hybrid cloud and cloud only. So these red ones here are sort of happening right now before our very eyes. So let's try to appreciate what it means to think exponentially. Now, it's easy for us to think in a linear fashion. If you step two and a half feet per step, and you're going to walk 30 steps, you're going, to get, you're going to go about 75 feet. But what if you're the same individual with very long legs, and you want to take those steps, steps exponentially? So you take two and a half feet on one step, and then you take five feet on the next step, and then you take 10 feet on the next step. Again, you need very long legs. But after 30 steps, you've gone just about a million miles. Now, I did, a, I did an Excel on this, and I was surprised. It's like 1.01 million miles. So it's very, very close to that. That's the cumulative distance that that person would have walked. So it's very hard, as you can imagine, for us as humans to anticipate and, and understand what that kind of growth really means. But we want to use these rules as guides for us to kind of predict ahead a little bit. Now, many of the people on the left of the previous slide, like the telegraph people, had to become the telephone people. And you get this curve here that looks like an S. It starts, starts down here, and then it goes to here. These are the, the ones that have gone out, and one business becomes another. So at some point, the telegraph had an exponential growth, and then it, then it started to flatten off. Some of these 
come to a dead end completely, like buggy whips, I suspect. Maybe there's a few still in the world. But some of these continue on very flat for a long time, and you wouldn't consider it exponential growth in any way, maybe even just linear growth in, in some, some cases. So understanding this helps us to appreciate this S-curve of, yeah, it starts off slow, it's exponential for a while, and then it has a different trajectory. So not all growth continues, and maybe there is faith no more, because by, by 2025, it might be so difficult to build a fab. Uh, somebody predicted it would be $16 billion to build a fab that, that can make five nanometer chips. But every one of those S-curves is replaced by what? Another what? S-curve. And this is the history that Niles Bohr was talking about when he said exponential growth will continue even if it's composed of a series of linear S-curves. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Now, do you, anybody knows what, what Moore's Law law is? The number of people predicting the end of Moore's Law will double every two years. So, <laughs> eventually, of course, because the population of the Earth is seven and a half billion people, it has to come to an end because everybody will be predicting it. Well, we'll just see. It certainly outlived many people's forecasts to say it will stop tomorrow. So let's look at the exponential curve and the S-curve at the same time. So we can go back here to Charles Francis Jenkins' radio visor in 1925 and consider that to be one of the generations where it was growing rapidly. He had 25,000 listeners to his uh, viewers to his little TV station. By the way, these, are, these pictures are all in the, uh, in the paper. Uh, not all of them, but this one is. Then we went on to the black and white S-curve and color, which is still going on, by the way, because we're adding new, new features to it. Then HD and uh, n about 1998 or so. And then HDR, which we talked about, Doug Trumbull and uh, Bob Seidel talked about it. And who knows exactly here. If you go back and look from 1878, and what happened in 1878 that's important to our business? Willoughby Smith discovered that selenium had a photoconductivity. Not, not photoelectric, didn't generate electrons, but you could modulate the conductivity based on light. And that was the beginning of, hey, I think we can, we can take an image and transmit it to an, an, another side. If you start way back here, there's about 11 of these S-curves. And image quality has improved since NTSC about 80,000 to one. Now, it's a really interesting analysis and this is not exactly correct because image quality is beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But if you look at all the various factors that affect image quality, going way back to uh, 1878 when a little bit of light could affect the conductivity of silicon, which is basically almost a binary decision at that point. Silhouettes were the very first videos um, or images by, by and large. That, that we have over a million to one improvement in video quality in the last 140 years. That's how long the idea of capturing light as an image has been around. So we can't predict with one long curve, but we can predict with a series of S curves on top of it. Let's talk about the evolution of infrastructure. We'll talk about storage systems first, then compute, and then network. Those are the big three, just very briefly on each one. So let's look at if we apply exponential thinking, because it has been this way for quite some time for storage capacity, what will it be in 20 years? Well, we're starting off with four terabyte drives today, although there's actually some eights. And if we look ahead and we apply a conservative 2x every three years, so it's, two, it's, it's, um, it's actually conservative, even Moore's Law is going at 2x every two and a half years. But since 1956 to 1914, it certainly followed Moore's law or even better. So when you went back to IBM, their RAM DAC, back in 1955 or so in San Jose, California, and they had a five megabyte drive, and you told the designer, you know, it won't be long before this is five terabytes. Oh, you're joking me. No, you just don't think exponentially, that's all. That's your problem, right? But you think exponentially, we'll have a 512 terabyte drive in 2037. Now, it's easy to argue that that's not gonna happen, and maybe it won't. But if you look at the research going on for how to increase bit density, you know, so many bits per, cube, per square centimeter, or even cubic centimeter in some cases, there's no doubt that something like this will happen. Let's talk about 
uh, compute for a minute. I talked about Moore's Law, so not a lot more about that, but here's a, a new processor that's come out called the uh, Tensor Processing Unit from Google, and it does, it's not really a Moore's Law comparison, because Moore's Law is about components, right, per, per IC, but this is about th these TPUs, and they built this, by the way, and they run them in, in their data center, and probably when you talk to uh, uh, the Google Assistant, this is, this is being, being involved, they deliver an order of magnitude higher performance per watt than commercially available products. So it's a different metric, but it's a very important metric because machine learning is very important to us. And will, it will become more important as time goes on. And that's the other aspect of compute, is machine learning. Now, I'm doing research for this, and I loved, I loved the research aspect of this paper because I didn't know what I was going to ex expect to find with regard to what others have looked at with regard to this. Two professors just recently from Oxford, 2016, they did a survey of 550, quote, experts in the field. So they made that decision as to who the experts were in machine learning and AI. And this was the conclusion of their paper. It said that results reveal among these 550 experts that AI systems will probably, and that's 50% of them, or 260 or so of these individuals, said that machine learning will reach human ability by about 2045, about 30 years from now, human ability. And very much likely, with a 90% probability, or 500 of the 550, said by 2075, or 40 years before the next simpty centennial that will happen on this stage. We'll all be here for it, won't we? Yes. And I can hardly wait to see that. This will affect us in a major way as we move forward. Even though these numbers are out pretty far, it's on a definite S-curve. Another thing that's growing, as of course, is Ethernet. So we're going to have 400 gigabit Ethernet before 2020. And if you look at the uh, Ethernet Alliance, this is their prediction, not mine, 6.2 terabits a second before 2030. Now, you're all video people, and you're thinking, why would I need a six terabit link. Well, if you look at the Lytro cinema camera, it generates a compressed output, but internally it has an uncompressed output, you might say. And at, at the frame rate that it runs, it's generating about three terabits a second. Now, if you had a venue, a sports venue, and you wanted to work with uncompressed, nothing wrong with saying it, uh, you'd need, for, 30, for 10 cameras, you need 30 terabits a second of mesh networking to be able to make that happen. And that could be today, because that camera exists. Very expensive. I'm not even sure you buy it. You probably lease it. Maybe some of you have actually used it. But the point is that's on the bleeding edge of a source of data. Now, of course, these huge networks, uh, network links will be used for aggregating uh, 40G and, and 100G and 400G as well. So there's plenty of opportunity to fill these links up. By the way, Ethernet is increasing at a Moore's Law rate, but you can't really apply Moore's Law to it. Why? Because speed has nothing to do with transistor density. But cumulative annual growth rates are similar. Let's look at a switch and router. Here we have a standalone switch. And this, you can buy this off the shelf today from a variety of vendors. 32 ports, 40G per port, of course, bi-directional. That's equivalent to about 1,700 1.5 SDI ports. So there's, there's a lot going on there, and that's only about a seven or $8,000 product. It doesn't count all of the fiber, but the basic unit. So we know that there's four aspects here I want to consider and think of each one as where will it be in 20 years? That's the point. Well, the first thing is link, link bandwidth. And that's going to go along according to the previous slide, uh, that the IEEE and all of the geniuses involved with that, yeah, it'll get up to maybe 10 terabits a second in the next 30 years. So that's going to affect routers and switches. Then routing performance will follow Moore's law. Silicon is what does the switching inside, after all. Silicon. Maybe someday it'll be photonic in 30 years. But the beautiful thing about Moore's law and switching, and basically it's packets per second, is what's called deep packet inspection. When you can do deep packet inspection, you can look below, you can look at the data layer, you can look at the M bit and the RTP payload and know that's the end of a video frame. And you can do that today with some specialized switches. So it absolutely will happen that in the future we'll be able to switch frame accurately if it's required in a, a switch or a router. It'll be a commodity because the deep packet inspection ability will be there. And I think, I believe customers will in fact require it for a lot of reasons. 
not just frame accurate switching. Uh, Shuba and uh, Pradeep talked about leaf spine architectures where you have layers of switches. And just with um, a simple leaf spine architecture, I don't show the picture of it here, but you can get a 16 times uh, more throughput. Now we're talking about, in this case, something like 40 terabits a second total through the system. And the other dimension I think is important, all oh, this is software only, but it connects to hardware because you can come up with a lot of great ideas, but the hardware can't implement it, it doesn't count. So there are things in software-defined networking today with OpenFlow and others to say, if your switch can do this, then we can, we can provision it, but some switches can't. Uh, in SDN OpenFlow 1.3, you can actually do deep packet inspection, but most switches don't support it, but they will in the future. So these four components are very important, and it, it certainly this is growing with a Moore's Law-like uh, growth rate. This certainly is, and this takes advantage of it because now you can aggregate together switches and build larger and faster systems. Let's talk about infrastructures. How you put all this together, the 500 terabyte drive, and by the way, and I didn't mention it, but it's in the paper, with regard to compute, I probably should have put up a slide that was equivalent to the storage one. The storage one said we go from four terabytes to uh, 512 terabytes. In compute, we go from uh, 24 cores, which is, I think, one, at least in, not in a GPU sense, because you can get many more cores in a GPU, but in, in a typical CPU, 24 cores becomes th about 3,000, about nine, 900 billion transistors on a chip, assuming again that Moore's Law continues in some form or another, even if it's Moore's Law 2.0. So let's talk about infrastructure. Now, I talked about the S ages before. That's a series of S's that come along that, that sort of come and go for us. The first one is mechanical, which we won't get into very much, but that was back in the 1920s. Analog AV came and gone. Now, you can still find it, but you won't go into very many facilities and, and find uh, an analog plant. Digital AV came, started, and I call digital, I'm talking about SDI, right? Because you can call it, Ethernet digital as well, but I think in our parlance, digital is, uh, is SDI. And that came around about 1991, and this course still, still continues in, in 2016. Then there's commercial off-the-shelf IP and AV. What this really is is file-based workflows, and that's when I started to get involved in the business in the early 1990s. When I worked at Hewlett Packard, we developed video on demand systems. We were moving files around with FTP and TCP, and we didn't think it was a big deal, but in fact it was a huge deal because we were replacing videotape and we were planning on doing it without really even knowing it. And that, of course, is live and well. Uh, most facilities now certainly would rather use a file than an SDI stream if they could get away with it, and they do. But this is a world that is strictly servers without the word virtualization attached to it. And many of the systems and products I've been involved in said, throw a server and you've got an application on it. Throw in another server, you've got, you've got a different application on it. But then we move into the next, next S-curve, which is software-defined media infrastructures. Now you're working with compute virtualization, software-defined networks, and software-defined storage, including huge amounts of automation to make them all to work together under some orchestration level. Now, the, the, the centennial issue of the journal has an article that I happen to write on this exact topic. So if you want to see a little bit more about software-defined media infrastructures and the hybrid aspects of them, using the cloud both publicly to an extent and certainly privately, and you'll see where the, this S-curve is right now. And there are individuals in this room that are using software-defined media networks, and there's companies that are building products that only work with, or work best with, I should say, Software-defined networking, software-defined storage, and software-defined compute, which is virtualization. And by the way, if you go to IBC or NAB and you look at a vendor who's got a product uh, that switches IP in real time, uh, like Paul was talking about earlier, um, and ask them, well, how are you doing the switching? And 9 out of 10 will probably tell you, well, we're using SDN methods to do this. Well, that's, as that's an aspect of software-defined networking. Because SDN networks, SDN techniques, software-defined networking, allows you to set the paths and the QoS much more accurately than non-SDN methods. You can do anything with existing protocols to a point, but you may not like the results because it doesn't scale well. Well, what's after this? 
full public cloud, software as a service. Now, software as a service also is included down here. But software as a service and X means what? Anything as a service. And believe me, anything will be a service. You can get just about anything you want. You want security as a service? You can find it. Identity as a service? You can find it. Disaster recovery as a service? You can find it. AI as a service? Absolutely, you can find it. So there's going to be more and more of this as time goes on, not, in fact, less and less. There will be a time. I remember the very first talk I gave here on the cloud about five years ago. Wow, what a hostile audience. Because everybody thought, there's no way, I've heard this so many times in my career, there's no way I'm going to put my content in the cloud. It's not, it's not trustworthy, it's not secure, it ain't going to happen. Well, there have been a lot of studies recently to show that the cloud, if you have not just any public cloud, but the major cloud providers, have actually more security, most likely, than your own, than your own facility. They certainly have a lot more people thinking about uh, denial of, uh, distributed denial of attacks that happened recently uh, throughout the United States on, on the DYN network. That the fact of the matter is that some people are actually suggesting if you have crown jewels, only put them in the cloud because that's the safest place and they can actually prove it based on the fact that your infrastructure probably isn't as secure as you think it is. And, of course, we can all see quantum computing coming up. Google has the D-Wave computer that they've been experimenting with. It's a, it's, a, it's a quantum device that I don't think anybody understands, including the builders. But there's going to be something in the future that deals with, with, with quantum aspects. Maybe it's quantum entanglement to send files. I don't know, but it's cool just thinking about it. By the way, this metric on the left, the progress metric, it could be quality, it could be amount of workflows, it could be Moore's Law, because I'm kind of bundling them all into one here. So don't bet against the cloud. The cloud data centers are, have a current growth path of 2x every three years. Now, this is based on revenue. And there's been a lot of people at Gartner and IDC that look at this very carefully. And if you read their studies and you go to their conferences, they are very bullish on where this is going. Most media people are very conservative. I understand it. Not only do we have real-time needs, we care about synchronization, timing, we can't lose any packets. There's all kinds of reasons. The reality is you can make it work. There's companies that are building cloud-based systems to serve hundreds of channels, real linear channels, that have a lot of viewers, they, can, they can't afford to go off air, so to speak. And they're doing it right now in the public cloud. But the number one metric for the cloud is trust. That's number one. If you don't trust that vendor, just like you're not going to buy from any vendor on the floor here unless you trust them, if you don't trust that vendor, then you won't, you won't move your content there or you won't move your control there or whatever aspect you want to move. But these aspects here are very, very important. And it will continue to be, because this is on a Moore's Law kind of growth curve. Now, when you think of the name Jim Phelps, who do you think of? Good morning, Mr. Phelps. Mission Impossible. Well, he's got a new gig. It's Mission Possible. So I'm going to go ahead 30 years, not 20, 30 years ahead. And let's see what all this amazing technology has done for Mr. Phelps and his new gig. He's running a media organization that's worldwide with hundreds of channels sports channels. And he has a digital assistant named Michelle. Not Siri, not Cortana, not Alexa. I have Alexa at home. I do like that product, by the way. It's very cool. Experiment with it. If you have Alexa, who's got Alexa at home? Ask it who's buried in Grant's tomb. It's smarter than you think. I think it's a, you get a very interesting result. So Mr. Phelps comes into the office and wants to know the status of his empire. Let's see what that is. Please click on that. Good morning, Mr. Phelps. Here is your October 25th, 2046 briefing. Worldwide, I am managing 450 sports channels in 85 countries. Operating margin is at 35%. There have been no visible faults in the past 425 days. Based on my forecasts, 
I recommend a new specialty handball channel in the Finnish language called Hand and Glove. I have access to live and historical game content for channel use. All haptic renderings and quantum transforms are prepared. ROI should be 15% within one year. Please note that Finland's league championships start in 65 days. This channel is ready to launch. Do you have any questions, Mr. Phelps? Amazing what Michelle can do, isn't it? Not only does she run the system, she analyzes for potential business opportunities and proactively goes ahead and secures contact, uh, con contracts, has a channel ready to go for Mr. Phelps who says, make it happen, Mr. Phelps. Or Mr. Phelps says that to, uh, to Michelle. And before you know it, they're making money because of the Finnish handball championships are just about to start. So not only is Michelle doing day-to-day -day business operations, she's predicting and based on a prediction allows you to make the implementation. Will that happen? Well, if we believe that the work by those two professors, that by 2045, 50% of the experts feel machines will be as smart as humans. And certainly 40 years before the next uh, anniversary of SIMTI, it will happen. Now, you have to take all this with a grain of salt, of course. I like this last quote here. The greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. So if you think that this is all oh, this could never happen the way it's being described, Gordon Moore, Gordon Moore could have never imagined there'd be a 30 billion transistors on a chip out of his fab 57 years later, but it in fact happened. Will this affect your, your future? If you're buying at NAB or thinking about IBC buys or from working with a product, Hopefully this, and you can read the paper for more information, will at least point you in the right direction for how things are going. Is it 100% correct? Of course not. So take it with a grain of salt. Thank you very much.